Hello, I'm Suzanne James for Green Left. Thank you for joining us. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land on which we live and work and pay my respects to the elders past and present. I also acknowledge all people of diversity in its many forms and champion their right to self-determination. Today, we will be taking a look at one of the biggest corporate integrity meltdowns in Australian history, that is the Price Waterhouse Coopers affair. While it's only in recent weeks that the explosive evidence in relation to them taking down both ends of the deal has come out, the matter goes back much, much further than that. One person that has been writing about it since at least 2016 is Mr Michael West of Michael West Media when he wrote Oligarchs of the Treasure Island. To help us try and unscramble the egg, he's joining us now from Sydney. Michael West, thank you for your time. Pleasure to be on, Suzanne. Now, when you wrote Oligarchs of the Treasure Islands back in 2016, you talked a lot about the damage that these companies are allowed to do, given the size of them and how difficult they are to break up. Take us through what the company structure are of these places, because they're not like Qantas and um, Telstra or Harvey Norman or any other corporation, as the layman in Australia may know it, are they? They're age-old partnerships with all sorts of special privileges and lay reporting requirements. Talk us through in layman terms how that all works and what their tax and legal structure exactly is in relation to their Australian operations. Well, as you noted, these are partnerships. And partnerships are an ancient structure, an ancient British structure going back centuries, and they're very opaque. There's not much in the way of disclosure required. And they're not hierarchical like companies. You don't have a board of directors and a you know, chief executive of, well, managing director and all the way down, they, they do have a managing partner and things like that, but effectively it's like a collective of people. And because of the disclosure requirements, unlike companies, they don't have to put out financial statements. They don't have to say who their own auditor is. They don't have to show related party transactions between the different related parties, money flowing from Australia overseas. Uh, they don't have, they only have to produce, they're only disclosure requirement here in Australia is to produce one number a year, and that is the revenue number. Uh, that's it. They don't just have profit or, or any of the other stuff, how much tax they paid, because, of course, it's the individual partners who pay the tax. So nobody knows anything about them, and here they are waffling out there about good governance and, and transparency and things, but there's only one number we've seen. And the real giveaway as to what's going on here is with that one number. They produce what's um, ironically called once a year, and this is their one governance obligation, once a year. They produce a thing called the transparency report. It's a marvellous, marvellous paradox. And in the transparency report, they show their revenue number. And if you look at that and track it over the past five years for the big four, EY, Deloitte, KPMG and PwC, you will see that their revenues, not their profit, their total income has been growing by double digits, more than 10% on average a year for all four of them. It's like if all four of your bakers in the same high street were incurring a double digit revenue rises, not profit rises. Now, how do they do that? They do it uh, because they're just getting an absolute mozza in government contracts. Now, the current Senate inquiry was supposed to be looking at all four of these consultancies, but it's ended up being all about PricewaterhouseCoopers. Now, some years ago, nearly seven years, isn't it, since their head of international tax at the time, Peter Collins, originally came up with this scheme where he was advising the Australian government on how to close loopholes in the tax law and multinational tax in the morning and then illegally shopping that out to their own multinational tax avoiding clients in the afternoon. That piece of information, the reason for his deregistration only came to light in the recent Senate inquiry because of the 119 pages of redacted emails that they received, which laid it all out in black and white. So just take us back to the very start, Michael. Who, what triggered the original investigation into the PricewaterhouseCooper head of international tax, Peter Collins? What triggered that investigation? Well, again, a marvellous paradox, uh, Suzanne, because, you know, I've been rabbiting on about this accident waiting to happen and these conflicts of interest for years and the power of these firms and the secrecy of these firms. But this has come, this scandal has come to light uh, because 
Uh, it had been brewing for a few years, mind you, because the ATO was on to it and some people in the industry were on to it. Um, it's from 2015 when this happened and it took five years of dithering for the ADO to get on and it's been eight years altogether. What happened was there's a little known body, nobody's ever heard of it before unless you're in the high-end tax world, called the Tax Practitioners Board. It's like the regulator. It says you've done the wrong thing, so we're going to ban you ban you from being registered as a tax practitioner. Anyway, so they banned, um, earlier this year, they banned this, this bloke, Peter Collins, who was like a leading tax partner at PwC. So we're talking about people uh, in Collins' sort of milieu uh, sort of pay between one and two million dollars a year. These are big earners, these guys. And Collins was the head. He was the guy that fronted the Senate inquiry where the laws were changed, which Christine Milne and myself and my contacts, thanks to their analysis, got going. Uh, and that ended up in these reforms, the MAL and the and the diverted profits tax reforms. So Collins was there. He gave evidence. So basically. What happened was there was a little note from the Tax Track Transitioners Board and somebody must have tipped off the Fin Review and Neil Chenoweth and Ed Tadros got on the story and they saw that this bloke had been banned uh, and they made some inquiries. They were obviously getting backgrounded by somebody because there was a kerfuffle going on between the Tax Board and the ATO. And it snowballed from there. And the funny thing was that they've went, well, why is this guy being banned? Oh, he's been banned because he was giving away confidential information to PwC clients. He he was advising the government on the new tax laws and advising his multinational clients on how to dodge the very same new tax laws. And so it was a pretty you know, scandalous thing to happen, but he was only given a two-year ban and PwC said, oh, look, this is outrageous what this guy's done and and we're going to have an integrity course, a conflict of interest course, a governance course as our punishment. But they tried to scapegoat this one bloke and call him a rogue partner who just run off the rails and all the partners got together and they had a meeting. I'd love to be a fly on the wall in this meeting <laughs> where they decided to blame it on this one bloke. But then some emails emerged um, uh, to the Senate to the Senate inquiry showing that there were at least 50 partners involved and that the information had gone far and wide within the PwC global network. So it was a systemic thing. Now, when that came out, Tom Seymour, the uh, managing partner of PwC, he got shot by the other partners. They went, well, we're going to get rid of him. He looks like a liar now. Of course, the cover-up became worse than the well, not as worse as the original crime because it was it's pretty bad what they've done. It's a it's a treasonous sort of national betrayal of no. all taxpayers in Australia. But anyway, it's snowballed and now there's about four names re revealed. There's nine that have been put on gardening leave, PwC, and there's another fifty odd who are going to be implicated or have been implicated, but whose names have been redacted so far. And so in the public purview now, you've got this dawning, this awakening of understanding what a significant, what a huge betrayal this is, what a massive tax scandal has probably cost the public purse, you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. Um, and the question, of course, is for the senators doing the inquiry, I've been in touch with them, you know, is it just contained to PwC or is this a more systemic thing? Does it, can we rope in the other big four one thing you and i both know from looking at corporate corruption is there's always more and it's something that's so explosive and so egregious as this it's very hard to believe that it wasn't common practice elsewhere as well but how bad is the culture michael when peter collins can go off and do all this and he goes back to his office and he sends off an email as if he's notifying everybody of the agm or something or an invite to the midwinter ball clearly if he's bold enough to put it in writing he's used to getting away with it yeah well i think this is goes to the heart of the problem and it's a bit hard when you're talking about cultural things to you know we can waffle on about it but in fact this is a problem of culture and the culture is these firms got too big too conflicted too powerful, and they know that they're beyond regulators and above regulation. There are no effective regulators, 
um, and their businesses are so vast and so profitable, they just never thought they'd get caught. It's not that they're better or worse than anybody else, but it's a, it's a systemic problem. And it has to be addressed because it does envelop the big four. If you look at the KPMG cheating scandal, hundreds of KPMG alumni were cheating in their chartered accountants exams. And that only came out because of a US regulator. It didn't come out in Australia. And the peak bodies here just sort of, oh, that's terrible. Oh, we must do something about this. But really, it's a cultural thing. How can you have hundreds of people cheating in their audit exams? And if you look at EY and Deloitte, uh, Callum Foote, our young reporter, has busted them last year for, you know, the independent experts reports they do, exaggerating the royalties and taxes paid to Australian governments by $20 billion, um, on behalf of the Minerals Council, who was their client, to show what great corporate citizens these resources fossil fuel companies are, but they forgot to count GST rebates, which, which so they inflated their figure by $20 billion. And we went, when we went to them, they couldn't explain it. And we had the detail of it, and we went to all the public information which they had, and we said, you're $20 billion over. Now, that's a com another conflict of interest because, of course, they're being paid as independent experts by a client that has huge vested interests. So it is conflicts of interest which are the real problem here. This is where they're really making their big money now is government consulting. They've convinced governments to basically privatise the public service and give them all the work. So they're now getting well over $1 billion in public funding through contracts to give advice to do paper shuffling for the for what do the work the public servants used to do. And so the public service has been gutted, it's been enfeebled, it's been weakened. Uh, and these guys are making double digit revenue gains every year as a result. Now that brings us to the next problem, obviously. This Senate inquiry headed by <laughs> South Australian Greens, Barbara Pocock, with support from David Shoebridge, who called it putting Dracula in charge of the blood bank, and also heavily supported by Labor Senator Deborah O'Neill. It, it's blown the lid off this scandal, and now it's publicly known across the board what PricewaterhouseCoopers have done, that there's likely to be a lot more than a number of people who are involved, and it well, it's quite possibly a global conspiracy of some kind to conceal the fact that they were selling this information. So everybody knows that now, and PricewaterhouseCoopers have been banned from further government work, but the problem is they are so deeply ingratiated in the Australian government's own compliance and audit systems. Their clients include the tax office, uh, AFP, the same AFP that's now supposed to be, again, investigating them for any criminality, uh, and defence, apparently, and they have all sorts of staff embedded in secure defence facilities with access to God knows what secure defence data. Now, Rhys Kershaw, for one, current AFP commissioner, told the inquiry he believed that they were good at compartmentalising investigations and others have suggested that um, there can be separation in those instances. I personally don't see it. What's your view on that? Where does that go from here? You know, I hate to be a pessimist. I'd say it's being a realist, but these guys are so powerful that um, they're going to see it off. And they've got expensive crisis management consultants and lawyers and everything like that, and they'll just tough it out. PwC will be damaged on the revenue front. Uh, reputationally, they're in the mud at the moment. But they'll just rebuild because they're so powerful, they're so ingrained in government, they're infiltrated. All of government, as you, you know, to defence. So this is a huge risk. Defence is the biggest, because the spending's going through the roof, is the biggest growth area of all their businesses uh, in advisory and consultancy. And mind you, there are no, there's no regulator for consultants. It's a free-for-all. They don't have any standards or anything they have to uphold. So all these guys, these consultants, have got all this defence material on their personal computers just ripe for a half-decent Chinese hacker to hop in there and hack it. But I, I'm not optimistic that there'll be any significant outcome because the only real outcome here when you've got these kind of conflicts of interest is to bust them up. Bust them up into consulting, tax and audit. Audit needs to be distinct anyway because this is a, this is a regulated, supposed to be a regulated business, which is meant to be in, actually truly independent and signing off on these accounts. Jeff Knapp and I, the famous forensic accountant, we've busted them 
all sorts of audit scams now. The standards have really gone through the floor because the auditors don't get paid enough. They're just there as a rubber stamp to give the to, to put, put the good name of, of PwC um, on the thing. So um, you know, so ninety nine percent or ninety eight percent of all the big global companies are audited by one of these four firms, these opaque partnerships. So audit has to be distinct because it's a conflict with giving tax advice. Tax advice is essentially, it's treason is the business model, as we um, wrote on the website the other day. It was a bit of a jarring thing for people to come to grips with, but that's what they do. Or any of these foreign, Exxon, any of these foreign multinationals, how to dodge tax in Australia. That's what they do. Uh, and the other one, of course, is government consulting, which is unregulated. And there's a conflict there if they're giving tax advice, as we now see from the PwC scandal, while they're benefiting financially from giving, you know, selling that tax advice to their um, their clients. Now, a lot of people have suggested, including yourself, that what's happened is so egregious that we should have a Royal Commission. Now, I saw what happened after the Banking Royal Commission, and basically... All it was was a report into the big board that showed them how much they could get away with. Ian the Rev at CBA walked away with 47,000 charges of no money laundering through AML CTF, um, still left with his golden parachute. Given that so many Royal Commission recommendations are so comprehensively ignored, wouldn't it be better to legislate it straight up, to break these places up, pull the people out until they had the new legislation in place? I don't think they should. Well, PwC certainly should be. In fact, we've broken the story. They've been continuing to get government contracts since the scandal broke. So that's falling on deaf ears. But I think that's going to start to dry up a bit now because there's a public understanding of how bad this is, what a national betrayal it is. But um, you, I, I just don't see, Suzanne, that there's going to be any... I mean, the last inquiry we had into these guys was the big four, was the audit inquiry, again, a Senate inquiry. And it was Deborah O'Neill. She's great, Deborah. She brought the inquiry. But the minute that happened, suddenly KPMG uh, partners, or one at least, turned up in a senior min uh, shadow minister's office as an advisor, like on secondment, giving his beautiful free advice to the government. I mean... <laughs> They are so powerful and they donate more than a million bucks a year to both parties. But O'Neill did a great job. She brought the audit inquiry. In any case, we covered that. I gave a submission to it and I followed it. And, and uh, you know, um, in any case, what happened was um, it just fell apart. Um, there was too much political interference. Um, and the final report... It, it, it was stopped short. It only just touched the surface. They ignored the good, solid evidence which people like myself and Jeff Knapp had given them as to audit scams and failures. They totally ignored it. And they came out with a report. It was about 30 pages. Half of it was like blank pages. It was just a rubbish report, which found nothing about the failures of audit. It just found nothing. There was a good submission by the Greens uh, you know, that went for a few pages of high indignation, just basically it was anger, uh, but the Liberal and Labor people found nothing. There was just no findings apart from, oh, we could work on some of the gender and pay gap issues, I think, was one, but it was unrelated to audit failures. It was a cultural thing. And it was Senator James Patterson, the IPA uh, guy, the, right, the um, Liberal Party guy. He was the chairman of the inquiry. He said nothing to see here. He rubbished Knapp's evidence, which was the best evidence given of all, as, which went, which was based on actual financial statements and audit failures, not just academic waffle. And um, Patterson just basically neutered the inquiry. It was disappointing for Deborah O'Neill. She's done a great job with Barbara Pocock, who's excellent too, <laughs> grilling the people in the PwC inquiry. But there'll be a bit of a slap on the wrist and then nothing will happen, in, in my view. There won't be any legislation. I, I very much doubt it because, of course, as we know, there's a double standard. If you're rich and powerful, the laws don't really apply to you. Uh, but if you're poor and vulnerable, then you'll, you could expect the full force of the law. <laughs> even for a debt that you didn't even owe. And now that you mentioned that, robo-debt was one of the things that... Um... Uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers are reporting to the government on, was it not? And they killed a report that never saw the light of day under Morrison into robo debt, which told them that it was illegal. Is that correct? 
That's well, they, they were just doing what they were told because the government's the client, and the government said, sh- it said, look, you know, just stonewall. You can cop a bit of the blame for this, and you know, why didn't that report ever see the light of day? And why did you not insist that this was a a um, a crime? And um, of course, they said, oh yeah, we did the oh yeah, we forgot this, and we go, oh, I forgot, and I didn't know, and. It's just all this evasive sort of testimony, you know. These people paid a million bucks a year, these people, and I didn't know. I, I wasn't aware of that, and I can't remember. I get what you're saying about Royal Commissions, and I used to have exactly the same opinion, that the Banking Royal Commission, in in effect, in the end, um, it's a lawyer's picnic, 100 million bucks. But 100 million bucks in terms of the cost of these governance failures is really not much... The benefit of a Royal Commission, as you know, is that Royal Commissions have extrajudicial powers to subpoena people and to say, no, you can't use your lawyers to block this. Just give us the information. That's the power of a Royal Commission. So stuff comes out in Royal Commissions. I've been following for years. The HIH one was stunning, the insurance one, massive failures. Now, there was good change to emerge from the HRH Royal Commission. APRA managed to get its act together. They were one of the most useless regulators ever conceived of before that. Um, The Banking Royal Commission, okay, have behaviours changed? Maybe not, but they've been tempered, surely. I mean, this business of selling products to to dead people, this business of systemic fraud by charging fees for services which were never rendered, uh, it allows all of us to see what's really going on. And that conditions behaviour. That changes behaviour. People go, yeah, that was really bad what came out there. We are now going to make sure this doesn't happen again. But effectively, in the end, you've got to have effective regulators. And the big four are not regulated. You know, if there's no penalty for a crime, no no penalty for a civil offence, or you could just keep on getting around penalties and never getting penalised and just getting paid millions, then you're going to continue with that behaviour. So ultimately, you know, they've got somebody's got to regulate this. The fact is, these guys are global facilitators of tax avoidance, costing governments around the world billions of dollars a year. Look, it's been fascinating talking to you today, Michael. It's mind blowing what's come out in that Senate inquiry, and no doubt it's a long way from over yet. We'll certainly be following the story to see if the Royal Commission does come out of it. Thank you so much for spending some time to speak to us about it today. Great to be on the show, Suzanne. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Michael. You've been watching Suzanne James from Green Left talking to Michael West from Michael West Media about the integrity dumpster fire that is the Price Waterhouse Coopers scandal. If you like our work, you can go to greenleft.org.au at any time and look at the many ways that you can be part of the solution instead of part of the problem. You can also like and subscribe this video or leave a com- comment or listen to us as a podcast.